Welcome back, everybody, to your... Well, me talking about something is what I'm trying to say here. Um, because this is not a Malazan video, again. So if you're here because you're not into Malazan, welcome! And thank you for showing up. Uh, today I want to talk about a book that I just finished reading today. And it kind of is, like, one of the best things I read this year. <laughs> and I want to talk about it. What I mean by that is The Hood by Lavi Tidar. Um, it's his second book in what he calls the Anti-Matter of Britain series. And the first one is by Force Alone. I did a video on that one. Um, so there might be some overlap here. But you don't have to read by Force Alone to read The Hood. I'm go just going to say this right now. We're going to do like something of a short like me gushing and telling you why y'all should read it. And why it's like basically a five, well, it's more like a six out of five star read and whatnot. Because I don't do reviews. And then <laughs> I'll talk a bit more about what makes this book so fucking great. Um, and before we do all of that, um, I got myself a special beer today. Um, this one is... Um, Kind of thematic, because we're talking about London, uh, you know, England a lot. Um, so I got myself an English beer, because I have one patron backer who asked me to drink a an English beer. Um, so I got myself a Old London Fuller's, Old London Black Cab Stout. I have no idea how it tastes. Um, and, yeah, this one goes out to Jack, who's also known as Rupert Crump on the Unabridged Burners. Thank you for buying me a beer, man. Um, if you also want me to force, uh, you know, drink some beer that you really want me to drink, then go and join my Patreon. There's no need to do so, but I, I definitely appreciate it, is what I'm trying to say here. Anyway, let's try and find out what this beer is like, shall we? Just open it. I got myself, actually, a glass and everything, so I'll try to actually not spill too much of it. We'll see how that works. Well, see that color? Well, I don't, <laughs> but, you know, it doesn't matter. It's all about the taste, isn't it? Um, well, cheers, right? Yeah, I'm not good at, you know, <laughs> pouring beer. I usually drink out of bottles because I'm a barbarian, but anyway. Nice one. It has this like very typical, slightly bitter coffee-ish taste that you expect from a stout. And I have no idea what I'm talking about. I just drink beer for, you know, beer sake. I'm not good at describing taste, but this one is really good. I enjoy this. So, uh, thanks Jack and cheers again. And now let's talk about um, The Hood by Larry Tidar. First, spoiler free, and then I'll take another sip, and then we talk about the spoilers. So, let's start. What is this? So, Larry Tidar is a, an author who is technically Israeli, I think. I grew up all over the globe, and he's written a bunch of science fiction and fantasy stories that I all highly recommend. If you really want to get, you know, see what you can do with um, the fantastic in literature right now, if you're, you know, really want to test out, like, all the, like, extremes, basically. And that's good. And I, as I said, first encountered him when I was reading Osama back in the day. I really loved his um, superhero story, The Violent Century. As a sword and sorcery fan, I'm a huge fan of his Gorel and the Potbellied God, which, go read that one. <laughs> it's really glorious. And then his later stuff, you know, Central Station, pretty cool. Um, Unholy Land, which has some parallels to another book that I really love, which is um, The Yiddish Policeman's Union by Michael Shabon, which you also should definitely go and read if you have ever time for that. And, uh, well, then, of course, A Man Lies Dreaming, which is rough. If you want to read a book about 
I might actually do a video on that one because it's really interesting to talk about. Um, it's about um, the Holocaust and other things and the rise of fascism, which we don't like on this channel, but, you know, it's interesting to look at anyway. And it's a glorious book. Anyway, Lavitinar decided to look at what is commonly known as the Matter of Britain and see what he can do with that. And uh, the first book he wrote in that so-called series is By Force Alone, which I talked about before, which is about King Arthur. And the way King Arthur as a legend and pop culture phenomenon and so forth um, is integral to British identity or English identity. And I highly recommend you read that book. You can also watch the video if you want, but the book's more important here. And, yeah, um, he now went to the next one, which is Robin Hood. And that's sort of what the hood is all about. It is a fantasy story roughly around the different versions, the different mythologies, legends, stories, um, incarnations, so to speak, of Robin Hood in La Vitidar's, um usual style, which is a fairly aggressive one, full of cursing, full of swear words, full of, like, all the other things that you expect from La Vitidar. So, if you have never read any Robin Hood books, you might, you know, miss a lot of references and stuff, but you still enjoy it, I guess. If you've read a lot of other media, not just Robin Hood, you'll get more out of it. Because this is, you know, I, I like uh, a lot of like postmodern fiction with a lot of pop culture references and stuff in it. It's something that I personally really enjoy. But La Vitidar is certainly you know, turning that part up to 11 in this book and, you know, in the one before. It's just insane the amount of, you know, throwaway references to movie titles, um, quotes from movies, songs, um, stories, what have you, that is in there. And there's, I'm sure I just, you know, missed most of it. I just caught a few and that was already more than I would, you know, that I've seen in most other books that I've read this year. Well, apart from, you know, By Force Alone, obviously. So this is a story, this is a book that is, first of all, a really extremely wild fantasy story. Set in England, there's fairies, there's Robin Hood, and other stuff going on. It, But it's turned, like, up, like, the craziness is turned up to a level that you normally don't see in fantasy stories or pseudo-historical depictions of Robin Hood. There's levels here that, you know... And this is great. This is something that I really enjoy about it. This is something that I really appreciate about it because it's we limit ourselves so many so so much when we read and write fantasy. There's oftentimes like, yeah, this is has to be sort of like pseudo medieval. So everything is dark and grimy and whatnot. And there's a few wizards or what have you, but that's it. It's like, no, of course you could you can you can put all the shit in there that you want. You could, you know, do weird fairy tales, do crazy jokes, put in some technology if you feel like it. <clears throat> all of that is possible because you don't have like there is no rules that tell you not to do that. But we tend to, you know, limit ourselves to what you might call genre conventions, and it is really good that we have people like Lavi Tidar. There's a few others that just don't give a fuck about that and just go ahead and do the thing and just like write whatever comes into their mind. So that's something that is in here that I really appreciate. Um, another thing is, once again, we're talking about, um, you know, Robin Hood, which is one of those stories that is very much like fundamental for the English identity. Not only for the English identity, there's obviously also, I mean, Robin Hood is probably even more so a universal global phenomenon compared to like the than King Arthur is because King Arthur is very much tied down to England. Robin Hood, the idea of, you know, stealing from the rich and giving to the poor is something that is, you know, easy to connect to wherever there is injustice, which is, you know, everywhere. <laughs> so, 
there's that, but it's interesting to look at how you can use the fact that this is something that is has been used for all kinds of ends all over the you know all all over history ever since we have like the first depictions of Robin Hood back in you know the fifteenth century, and how that Robin Hood differs so much from what we have today when you look at for example the fact that like early Robin Hood is not depicted as stealing from the rich and giving from the poor but just uh, giving to the poor but just you know an outlaw living in Sherwood Forest. Now all these like layers are put onto a kernel of a story and are then used for all kinds of questions of identity. So having someone go and deconstruct that and take it apart in all kinds of ways is very, very helpful. And something that Lavi Tidar does, again, he, as I said, he did the same with King Arthur, but he, there's different aspects to Robin Hood because Robin Hood has is a very different myth or legend compared to King Arthur. So the need to deconstruct or be aware of the fact, and deconstruction can help us, to understand the fact that these stories have changed over time and are usually adapted to fit a specific worldview, a specific situation, and so forth, to, um, you know, <clears throat> the fact that this is the case, which, what a stupid sentence. Anyway, <laughs> point is, um, now, like, a violent deconstruction is um, very helpful in understanding that. Uh, and Labitidar is a master of that. So the next bit that I want to talk about here is irreverence. Um, I'll say this again. Once again, you should all go and read this book as quickly as possible and then talk to me about it because I'm super fucking excited about it. But be aware, this is a book that is... Um, Full of irreverence, and I personally am a huge fan of irreverence of all kinds, um, but I can understand that some people might be put off by that. Look, the book starts out in the first sentence, we're already talking about Norman's fucking goats, and it doesn't get better from then on. It doesn't get tamer from then on. So if that is something that you find you, you have whatever kind of problems with, then this is not the book for you. I would once again say... This is not just, you know, cursing, you know, swearing for swearing's sake. There is a, there is a method to it. There is a reason why it is that way, which is the idea of irreverence. Because with people like King Arthur or Robin Hood, and like every single country in the world has those mythical characters. And we tend to put them on some kind of pedestal of reference, uh, of reverence and what or So... Being reminded of the fact that this is us doing that. There's no need to be super, you know, reverent about King Arthur or Robin Hood or in other countries. I don't know. Well, won't we German like Siegfried and the Nibelung or whatever? Fuck those people. We made that shit up. And it's important to be reminded of that. And the way that Tidar does that is exactly through irreverence and um, violence, and showing, and pu pulling it down to the human level, to the, the grubbiest possible human level. So that's something that is in here, and I think it's good that it is in here, but I can understand that some people might have taken issue with the language, so... <laughs> if you don't want to read the F word like five to six times per page, well, first of all, you're missing out on a good book, but second of all, yeah, this is not your book. So, what, what else should we talk about here? All right. Um, anachronism, sort of, which is, once again, important here. It makes a lot of sense, because what we have is, obviously, a very modern language, a very modern depiction. There's, you know... People are basically gangsters, they form gangs, they sell drugs, they do all these things. Um, as a, the, the language is extremely modern. And this may once again be, you know, disturbing or whatever to people that are used to reading fantasy that pays a lot of attention to 
developing some form of immersion, not using contemporary words, all that stuff. And yeah, there is obviously good good reasons why to do that. But on the other hand, we're talking about history. History is made up. These are legends. It's not even, you know, actual historical people living. We're talking about something that was made up back in the day and then changed and fitted to every new age it was popular in and popularized in. So using the anachronisms, using a very modern language, using very modern ideas in here makes a lot of sense because that's that's what we do with legends with mythology we adapt it over time to make it fit our own circumstances so of course there is like discussions of capitalism and um, sexism in here because that's what you know those are some of the uh, major like discussions and debates of our time were those the same debates back in the 15th century well Yes and no, I guess, like, different word, but the idea of, like, ownership, land ownership, and what, you know, derives from that, stuff like that, was obviously a big issue back then as well. Um, uh, male privilege probably, well, wasn't as much, you know, as widely discussed as it is today. But still, it makes sense to put all these modern things in there, because... The idea is that you don't just like look back at some form of <clears throat> legend and use it as like this entertainment thing that is back there in the past and you just go back and romanticize it. No, if you want mythology or legends to work, you need to, you know, they need to change with the times so they are still, you know, speaking to us. And in a way, Tidar does that. Obviously, there is a it is a more like I guess progressive kind of worldview that is behind that in a way. Um, but so what? You can just go as well, go out as well, and write like a very conservative right wing version of it if you feel like it, or probably not like it. <laughs> but it's still better than just going back and romanticizing the old version and having I don't know Errol Flynn jump around in like weird costumes and whatnot. That's that's sort of what. But mythology, what makes mythologies or parts of a national identity powerful is something that we tend to forget in our um, society nowadays when we talk about the quest for, you know, authenticity, which authenticity is a fucking lie. It doesn't exist in fiction. <laughs> All right. Um, the last thing before we go into, like, more concrete spoiler stuff is... Um, Jewish identity. And it's something that was already there a bit in um, by force alone and the King Arthur stuff, but it's more prevalent here with a character that Lavi Tidar basically took out of Ivanhoe by Walter Scott, Sir Walter Scott, which is one of the sources that he uses here. Um... And the good thing here, and also the good thing in By Force Alone, and something that we have, but I'm very glad that Lavi Tidar does, is to write stories about European pseudo-history, mythology, legends, and just point out that Jews have always been part of that heritage. We've just, like, in our anti-Semitic anti past, and anti-Semitic presence, don't get me wrong there. <laughs> We've always tended to just, like, write them out of the stories, write them out of the histories, put them to the sides. Which is, for example, why I love um, The Long Ships uh, by Bankson so much, because, yeah, there's Jewish characters in there that just, like, you know, of course they were there, because there's... <laughs> Jews have been living in Europe ever since, I don't know, the Roman Empire, or maybe even before that, I'm like, that much of a scholar on like Jewish history because you know I'm not smart um, <laughs> but the point is <laughs> they've always been there but they never show up unless they show up in like very you know caricatures anti-semitic caricatures um, in negative roles but the the fact that they have always been 
part of our lives, of our history, is something that we tend to ignore in fiction. Lavity Dar does not. He puts it in there all the time, both the good bits and the bad bits. And it's important to have, like, you know, I don't want to call anyone a sympathetic character in this book because no one really is. Um, but you have, like, all the mentions of the casual anti-Semitism that has happened, that is happening in those historical times, which is mostly the 12th and early 13th century. Um, yeah, it's good that it is in there because we tend to ignore that when we look at, you know, the romanticized medieval Middle Ages that we see in our uh, TV shows and his pseudo-historical novels and whatnot. We kind of tend to gloss over that because, you know, it's not something to be proud of. But even though maybe, well, not in the uh, treatment of Jews, but in other parts, even though Tidar might go way out of his way, you know, to paint those times darker, more brutal and whatnot than they really were or whatever, because we don't know. Um... Especially in, say, the last century, like ever since the Romantic Age in Germany and what have you, in like the 19th century, actually, when when we just kind of constructed a picture of the Middle Ages, which is, on the one hand, you know, everyone is poor and fucked up, uh, except for, like, the church and all the romantic, you know, courtly shit going on with knights and whatnot. Um, we still tend to gloss over, over, uh, over a lot of that stuff. And by just, you know, kicking down all the doors and, you know, taking an axe to all those cliches, um, Tito reminds us that probably it was, you know, life was life back then and people were assholes. People were trying to survive and Jews were treated like shit because that's what we Europeans tend to do because, you know, it's just something we tend to do, which sucks. <clears throat> So, um, <laughs> to reiterate what I said before, go read this book. It is the best treatment of Robin Hood and a masterclass in postmodern fiction, um, the metafiction and all the other stuff. It is highly enjoyable. You can basically quote every single fucking sentence in this book and it makes for a good quote. Um, <laughs> just one of those dialogues, like, what is money? Money is debt, backed up with a threat of violence. I do so love money. Anyway, go read that book and then talk to me because we need to talk about this book. More people need to know about this kind of book. And it's a shame that no one is doing it so far. So anyway, I'm highly entertained. It's definitely one of my top five reads this year if I ever come around to actually making some sort of like ranking or whatever because I... I really hate ranking stuff. But anyway, it's a masterpiece. You go read it. It's out now. It's glorious. And yeah, I had a lot of fun with it. So I'll just have like a long sip of beer of this glorious um, black cab stout from London, from Fuller's. And then I'll talk a bit more like concrete stuff that I found interesting in here. Let's talk spoilers, shall we? All right. Um, so, once again, what makes this book so good is sort of what made um, by Force Alone also so good and so entertaining to me is a lot of the, the references and metafictional stuff in here. The way it is handled and what it kind of shows. We're going to go into some details later on, but, you know, one of those things like the way Lavi Tidar manages to um, use all kinds of media and apply it, or like story structures and <laughs> modes of talking about stuff and applies them to different things and shows in that way that you can move around these things. The way the Guy of Gisborne story that, if you're a Robin Hood fan, you already know, um, you know, him being sent as this badass killer to go and kill Robin Hood. Um, the way he writes it, which is basically Apocalypse Now, or, you know, in a different version to, say, like, Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. It's like the, well, the war veteran being sent there to deal with that guy who went dark in the forest. 
that's just really fucking cool. And it kind of shows how those, like, story structures can be reused again and again and again. And it's something that just makes me laugh out loud. Then there's all the, the, the jokey kind of references when you have those guards at the gate guards that are those two guys. And one of them is called Bert and one of them is called Ernest. And, um, yeah, well, I don't have to explain that to you, I suspect, I hope. <laughs> but it, it's super funny and it took me like, I don't know, two or three introductions to realize that joke. And I'm like, you didn't. No, no, no he did motherfucker um <laughs> and there's other stuff in there that goes in the same direction all these like throwaway lines for jokes or movie quotes that are just like thrown in there but there's also like deeper stuff that is not as like contemporary when you have all the situations when he goes back and some people talk in rhyme and all these like very specific typical rhymes that you get in you know English folk ballads and folk songs, whether that is you go and read, you know, the child's ballads from the 19th century, or you go and read, you know, listen to 60s and 70s folk rock, which is fucking brutal, um, to be fair, because most folk ballads are fucking brutal and cruel. It's like, it's not a folk song if no one dies or gets raped. It's sad, but that's sort of when you look at, like, traditional folk songs, that's sort of what happens there all the time. The way he does that is just really interesting and really impressive. Another thing that I really appreciate is like the metafictional level of it. When you have the idea that Robin Hood is more of a figurehead or more of a metaphor. And you have like a bunch of Robin Hoods go living and dying because the role of Robin Hood can be used usurped by anyone or taken by anyone the way he does that is just like a really cool idea <laughs> especially when you have that person um rob because who then becomes another robin hood later on and he's like it, it is always emphasized that he's not speaking and then he starts talking and it's like yeah well he didn't talk the, all the way from london back to nottingham well he wasn't important for the story back then so the, the the meta commentary on how stories work and how we write stories, how we talk, how we tell stories is another level in here that I really, really appreciate. Um, and I feel this part is is a bit more pronounced in uh, Robin Hood than it is in King Arthur. Then obviously we have that last part or no, last part, like second to last part, something like that. Uh, the narrator. When, when it gets even more metafictional and we have like the reflection on all the King Arthur stuff in there as well. And it's like trying to um, actually go there and talk to people and research a story. And it's like, no, you make that shit up because that's more interesting. And those people actually involved don't want to be reminded. So you have that idea in there as well, which is fantastic. I mean, this is a short book. It's like, the audiobook's like 11 hours. It's, I don't know, I guess 400 pages. <laughs> Probably less than 400 pages, like 350 pages or something like that. And it packs so much, like, I don't want to say it's dense, but it is fucking dense when it comes to the amount of stuff that you can take out of it. You don't have to. You can just go and read it as a hilarious, like, violent deconstruction of... <laughs> <laughs> of Robin Hood and using the Robin Hood ideas um, to deal with stuff like um, PTSD and the survival like the, the way we treat war veterans because obviously there is that whole parallel between how we treat veterans of the Gulf Wars and whatnot um, nowadays compared to you know back then and all that it's all in there in a ton of really interesting ways but you can just go and read it as a fun story of really terrible people doing really terrible stuff and just marvel at how how violently you can actually destroy any idea of robin hood that is sort of always floating in our back and this i feel is what makes both by force alone and this one so good um the hood so good it's like even someone who is not british who's not from england there we all like because of how, you know, colonialism works and how 
global media works on. We all have ideas in our heads of King Arthur and Merlin and Robin Hood. Those ideas are vague. Like, I don't know how many of you have read any like source material. Have you read Howard Pyle's Adventures of Robin Hood and His Merry Men? Well, I have. But anyway, <clears throat> have you read Ivanhoe? I have, but it's like most of us don't. We've maybe watched one Robin Hood movie when we were kids, probably the, the Disney version with the fox, um, which is really cool uh, to say because there's a fox. Uh, <laughs> um, but apart from that, we have, even if we have not even watched a single one of those, we know who Robin Hood is. We know who King Arthur is. We know who Merlin the Wizard is. We know. Because we have that, if we grew up in the Western Hemisphere, probably even parts of the rest of the world, we have those like weird, vague ideas of it in our mind. And what Tidar does, and what I appreciate so much about it, is he goes and just like, you know, I'll just use the weirdest parts of the actual source material and just twist them a bit. <laughs> and let me show and then I'll show you how far how far you can actually go with just that beyond you know your common conception which is as I said like so bound up with um, uh, national identity in a lot of ways so that's something that I really really appreciate about um, both by force alone and the hood I think the hood with like more on like the mushrooms and the fairies and all that stuff that's going on there is as I like much more about how we tell stories how how the power of words the power of how we construct ideas and that's something that I personally appreciate more Christianity more church bashing is certainly something that I like in there <laughs> it's a lot of fun um, and yeah, it's just a bloody good book and you should all go and read it and I really want to talk more with you about it. So please let me know in the comments and then we can do more of that. And if I ever get a chance to actually talk to someone like Lavi Tidar, I would love to do that as well. Well, you know, I'm just a small time person on a balcony drinking beer, so that's probably not going to happen. Anyway, I'll, um, you know, go and do life things now and uh, talk to you tomorrow about something else and uh, yeah have a great weekend cheers <laughs>